Hi guys, welcome back to the fourth ever podcast episode. I'm here with fellow photographer, um, YouTuber, and Twitch streamer, Eric Flynn, and we're going to be just talking about some of his work, and he's going to be sharing some examples and everything. So let's just jump right into this. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Who are you, and what are you doing right now? All right, um, I'll give you the rundown. Uh, my name's Eric Flynn. I am 27. I have to double check that. Um, I... <laughs> I uh, got my undergrad degree in psychology after doing two years of biomedical engineering um, at Georgia Tech. I spent a couple years working as a lab uh, research assistant. I worked at an elementary school as a special ed paraprofessional before I uh, really started exploring my photographic passion. Um, it's always, actually, I have my, uh, my first camera still that I ever got uh, when I was four. So photography has always been an interest of mine. But during the course of working at the elementary school, I started taking pictures of a lot of the school events. Um, and through my connections at the school, I started tutoring. Um, well, we'll go ahead and do the rundown. So I <laughs> was tutoring some kids I had taught at the elementary school. Uh, their parents recommended me to some of their friends, so I started tutoring a high schooler. So that went pretty well. I'd only known him for uh, like two weeks at the point his mom asked if I wanted to chaperone him on a trip to D.C. because he didn't want to go on the family vacation to the beach. So she was like, we'll pay for your plane ticket and give you guys money to go hang out. And you can stay with some friends in D.C. for a week. I was like, oh, yeah. sweet, free travel, <laughs> done. Um, so it turned out um, the par the their friends who we were staying with, their son went to the program I'm in now. Um, I'm currently a master's student at Ohio University, um, visual communications. I'm specializing or focusing in photojournalism. Um, so their son was in the program and we were talking photography and he asked if I'd ever considered going to school for it or pursuing it as a career. And uh, at that point I hadn't. So that was last summer summer before last, it was two years ago now, was, yeah, that would have been 2018. Um, so I got my application together, I went and checked out the program, I liked it, I applied, uh, and got in. So I've been uh, in Ohio for the last, what, was eight or nine months since last August. I'm back in Georgia now due to uh, the great unpleasantness, <laughs> as it were. Um, but yeah, the, the photojournalism thing is a, uh, a new angle on photography. Um, yeah, can you speak a little bit more to that? Like, what exactly is photojournalism, and what do you uh, want to achieve by studying photojournalism? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, so, my interest in photography has always been storytelling, right? Uh, when I was at the elementary school and I was taking pictures of the school events, I wanted each and every picture to encapsulate the moment. And, you know, even if you weren't there and part of it, you could tell what was going on or take some piece of that scene with you. You know, a lot of times parents aren't at all the events, so it's really nice when they can see what happened and share the moment, even if they weren't there. So that's kind of the goal of photojournalism is to... Um, preserve the moment and tell stories. So, you know, I was when I was talking with um, Tom Woodruff, um, who, his parents I was staying with in DC, um, he was like, yeah, that sounds like uh, you'd be a good fit for the program. <laughs> I was like, neat, I didn't know any of that. So it's been, um, you know, I really jumped in the deep end with it. Uh, yeah. But it, so, if, you know, photojournalists traditionally work um, at newspapers or, you know, for, I mean, newspapers is a big one for photojournalists, although that's been declining rapidly in recent years. Um, so as far as my goals with it, um, I don't know, I just like taking pictures. I, and I, I really like... I don't know. That, I mean, that's that's been the big thing. I, part of the reason I went to school is to try and figure out what I want to do with it. Because um, there's, you know, commercial photography. Yeah. 
which is all well and good, and the the final outcomes right now for photojournalism are you either get a, a staff job, you find a, a position at a newspaper, or with a magazine, or with a website, and you work more or less full-time taking pictures and coordinating with events and trying to find things to take pictures of, or you freelance, and people reach out to you. Um, so I've met a ton of people now who are freelancing, or a lot of people, after they go to school for it, end up as photo editors. So uh, one of the, the people in the program now, um, who I love to death, is um, Molly, uh, who was a senior photo editor at National Geographic. She's our, our night fellow for the program, um, and she is just a blast to talk to. She has so much experience and knowledge. Um, but, you know, as a photo editor, what you do is you work with the photographers and try and select the images that end up making it to publication. So as a freelancer, you end up doing a fair bit of your own photo editing because no one wants to get your full take of 2,000 pictures. <laughs> or in the case of one of my roommates, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the, the class process. Uh, one week, he had to turn in 20,000 images because that's how many pictures he took that week for um, our photo essay class. That's a lot of pictures. I, I, I think on my new camera, I've put like maybe 15,000 pictures on it, and I've had it for a couple months now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you shoot Canon, right? You have an EOS R? Yeah, I, I have an EOS R, and my primary lens is the USM 50mm 1.2. Right. Yeah. That's my go to setup, mostly for portrait photography and concert photography. Do you have any um, long glass? you have any telephoto lenses? Yeah, so I have a, uh, a Tamron 35 to 150. That's like what I use whenever I'm just like out in the field doing whatever. Um, it's also got IS on it, so or, or VC nice. for, for Tamron. Um, so it's a good lens to, to use for vlogging and stuff like that since it's a little more forgiving. Since the EOS R doesn't have um, in-body stabilization, it has um, digital stabilization, but you know it's got a crop factor in it. So, have you tried shooting any of the um, Nikon mirrorless cameras? Uh, no, but my uh, girlfriend Lindsay is uh, a Nikon shooter, and she's been saving up to get the Z6, I believe. Yeah, um, so. that's a rocking video camera. Um, yeah. So, part of my my job at the. Um, you know, as a grad student, you have some, some additional respons responsibilities outside of schoolwork. Um, so I worked, or I work still, planning on going back, in the uh, equipment room, right? So we have a, a pretty well-stocked equipment room that kids can check out camera gear, um, which means I've had just an unbelievable opportunity over the last couple months to try out all kinds of cameras and lenses that I otherwise, you know, it's... They're massively expensive to buy or even to rent, um, and provided they aren't checked out, you know, depending on, you know, if it's, uh, you know, sports season, all of the long glass is always gone. Yeah. But um, it's been fun. So the, the, the mirrorless stuff is a lot of fun, although as for a lot of what I do, I still prefer my DSLRs. Really? Yeah. What, what gear do you shoot on? Um, so when I started getting back into photography, um, I had my wife's old Nikon D80. I don't know if you're, might not be familiar. So I think it, oh, I still have it over here. Um, it's a, an APS-C sensor. Um, I think it's got a, like a, it's not, um, I forget what kind of sensor's in it. It still does phenomenal colors, even though it's only like a 10 or 12 megapixel camera. Is it not like um, a CMOS sensor? No, it's not CMOS. It's, uh, I'll have to look it up at some point. Um, but it's got garbage ISO and lousy low light because it's, you know, I, when I, even when I started shooting, it was already like a 12 year old camera. Yeah. Um, and then after about a year of shooting that, I saved up and bought uh, a refurbished, uh, I've actually only ever bought refurbished cameras through Nikon, um, uh, D5600, okay. which is still my uh, go-to second camera. Um, so when I'm out, you know, working on assignments and things, this is usually hung over my shoulder, tucked in my bag, usually with, um, I keep the 20 millimeter f1.8 on it, because with the crop factor, it's a 30 millimeter lens, mm -hmm. which is still fairly wide, but not 
quite as uncomfortably wide as the 20 millimeter yeah. is. That's um, so that kind of tempers it down, and then I can, you know, and just whip that out if I need it. But I saved up, and uh, after I got into the program, before I started, um, I got a Nikon D850. Okay. Yeah, because, that's a nice camera. That's like their flagship DSLR. So. Yeah. Um, well, aside from like the, well, the yeah, truly the, professional, the D5 and now the D6, yeah. um, but I don't I don't need those. I've had a chance to shoot on the D5s um, for some of the sports assignments. I checked them out, but this is this is my baby, um, and I've got the uh, 70 to 200 on it. Yeah, that's a piece of a lens. That's actually the lens that my uh, girlfriend primarily shoots on with her Nikon as well. Yeah, they're excellent. Um, the other lens that I want to get soon is um, Nikon has a 300 millimeter f/4, and it's it's smaller than this and lighter than this, and just oh, I love it. Um, and then I use the um, the Spider Pro belt mounts. So oh, yeah. I can I can hang this off my hip, mm -hmm. which is really nice because otherwise it's really heavy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I like my my hand straps a lot. Um, everyone else has their their neck straps, and they laugh at me, but I I, I, I get it. I'm I'm a fan of the hand straps. I I, yeah. I hated them until I started using them. So I'm I'm a, a Nikon shooter <laughs> through and through. Uh, unless I'm shooting film, although even that's not entirely true because I have a, a Nikon FM2. Um, yeah, uh, speak a little on some of the film cameras you have uh, sitting behind you a little bit. So. <laughs> okay, so I've got... Uh, we'll, we'll do a little tour. Um, I don't know if I want to turn the webcam or not. It's a little bit of a mess. So uh, I've got the Nikon FM2. I might bring some things over. Uh, that is my, my go-to black and white film camera. Um, do you shoot much film? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, so I've got the Nikon FM2, which is my go-to black and white film camera. Um, if I'm shooting color, I don't know why I maintain this distinction, but I have a, a Canon AE-1. Okay, yeah. I just good camera. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's simple. Everyone should have one. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> It's uh, not quite as rugged, and I love, have you, the FM2 is like, if I'm shooting 35 millimeter, this is, this is my, my desert camera. This is the one that uh, goes with me to the island. Um, and then for fun goofing around shots, I've got a little Konica C35, <laughs> a little point and shoot range finder. Um, you know, if we're, if we're, if I'm hanging out with friends and we're all going to someone's house to, you know, look at prints or photo books. I slip this in a jacket pocket and take fun pictures. Um, and then I've got my, my Kodak collection. So I've got, uh, I found, I like going to thrift stores and looking for old cameras. So this is a mock TLR, it's a Duoflex. It has like a, a single shutter speed. It's meant to be mounted to a, uh, a flash unit. I haven't been able to find one yet, but it's, I have all of these medium format Kodak cameras, but they all shoot 620 film. Yeah. And I, I hate re-spooling 120 film onto the 620 spools. I don't blame you. So I, uh, I have them, I like them. I don't use them as much as I would like. Um, I have uh, one of the early Kodak Retina Reflex cameras. Okay. Which, they're quirky and silly and they weigh way more than you think they should, um, but they work beautifully. The rain, the um, light meter on this still works, and I've got some of the um, I've got some lens attachments, um, so you can do uh, macro work with it. And then one of the the gems of my collection is this Metalist II. Um, so I bought this broken for twenty bucks, which is ridiculous. Because um, if you ever look on like KEH, even a broken one, uh, they had one for over a year that was $175 that I was very tempted by and then I stumbled on this. So this is a World War II era camera um, but again it has the same problem where it shoots 620 film so I've only put you know maybe a roll or two through it but it is a, it's got a Kodak Ektar lens it's beautifully sharp um, a pain to use and I love it. That's a cool looking camera for sure. Yeah, and then uh, 
you ever shoot an Argus C3? No, I haven't. Okay, well, if you have to get another camera, I you have to have an Argus C3 in your collection, right? It's one of the, the granddaddies of um, 35 millimeter cameras. It's one of the earliest cameras that was massively available and widely popular, and pretty much everyone had one. You can pick them up 20 to 40 bucks. Uh, they're called bricks, they look like bricks. <laughs> they're dead simple, and if you ever wanna get uh, your feet wet at you know, disassembling and repairing cameras, these are great because they're simple. Uh, but if you want even simpler, you can get the Argus A, which precedes it. This is uh, from like 1936. Well, it's got ridiculous Art Deco stylings. So the, the story goes, Argus originally manufactured uh, radios, right? Mm -hmm. But not everyone, so the demand for radios wasn't constant year round. So <laughs> they had a sort of an off season. Um, and to keep, you know, all the equipment used and productive, um, Leicas were starting to become a really popular 35 millimeter camera. However, they're super expensive, even back then. Um, so they made uh, a cheap camera that looked kind of like a Leica, shot 35 millimeter film, and everyone went crazy for it. So you can kind of thank these for why 35 millimeter became uh, popular and widely available. Okay. Yeah. And then I've got my first camera, a little Kodak Star 110. Um, it shoots, I've got a roll somewhere, where is it? Um, it's got lousy little cassette film. Um, they are, I don't know where I put it. Um, it's awful, it's small. I shot this a ton when I was a kid uh, and I'm glad I still have it. And then I've got, Oof. my old Polaroid camera. I took all of my wedding pictures with this. Um, well, I let, I had this available for guests to take wedding pictures while I shot a couple pictures of my D850. And then I've got the, uh, sort of the shelf of broken dreams and broken cameras. It's underneath where I've got some of my grandmother's old Exacta cameras. Um, I've picked up a couple of ancient digital cameras that are in various shades of broken. Um, when I go to thrift stores, a lot of times they'll have like a camera bag for 30 bucks. Cause you know, someone's grandma came in and dropped off all their old cameras to sell. Uh, and they just sell the whole thing for super cheap. So I've got a huge collection of camera bags and a lot of those, you know, uh, APC film and lousy early Canon Rebels. I, uh, I have too many cameras. No, I, I definitely understand. I have quite a collection myself. I can't, you know, rattle off the names of all the cameras I have like you can, but um, my prize, I guess my prize couple of possessions is I have a Pentax SP, which I shot on until it started having uh, shutter issues. I shoot on an F4 now, which is, I love the F4. It is an yeah. amazing camera. Um, it's paired with a great lens too. It's, it's sharp. Um, and my prized possession camera is the miniature speed graphic. I, I love shooting on that camera. And then I also have just like a cheap Canon uh, point and shoot 35 film camera um, that I use just for like snapping random yeah. photos and stuff. Um, so when you shoot your speed graphic, do you shoot roll film or are you shooting two by threes? I'm shooting two by threes. Um, I haven't gotten to, um, I know you can buy like the roll back for it or whatever, but I. Don't uh, I don't really care. I, I like shooting the two by three process. It's it's cool getting to load your own film and, and uh, shoot it like how they were back in the thirties whenever it came out. Yeah. Now, have you been processing your own film? No, I um I get it developed um, um in a lab in Austin. They do it on site and the turnaround is relatively fast. Um, when I first brought it the, to them, they had never seen two and a quarter by three and a quarter sheet film before. And so they were all kind of freaked out by that because, you know, usually see like four by eight or five by 10 or whatever the standard size is. So I was just like, you just develop like, like normal sheet film. And so they yeah. did it for me. Um, in fact, like the first time I ever had it, there, there was, um, they had like, 
I guess it was rolled sheet film, like where you like pull out the slide and then you'd shoot that shot and you'd pull out the next slide, shoot yeah, that shot. Yeah, the, the graphomatic. Yeah, yeah, those things yeah. are cool. Yeah, so it came with one of those, and it it had 16 shots on it, and I originally brought that to them, and they had no idea how to develop it or take it apart, so I had to, like, look it up for them and uh, walk them through how to, like, take it apart and develop it. Um, but, yeah, I, I love shooting on that camera. I love how, how detailed it is for, like, such an old camera. I, I highly recommend, though, at some point, you know, it doesn't... Process your own film, man. It's so much fun. If, unless you're shooting color. Um, I, I actually have um, a, a crap ton of um, color chemistry coming my way because one of my family members reached out to me and asked if I could process color film and if I would process, you know, I think they have two dozen old rolls um, and what my price would be to scan and send them prints. Um, so that gets to be my project. Color film I don't like working with, but <laughs> I will. Uh, but black and white is so much fun. Um, you know, making making your own prints is fun. I haven't done that as much in a while. Um, but it's you know super easy to process your stuff and then scan it or just take pictures of it. Yeah, I mean, um, I the shop that I get developed at in Austin actually has the option to get it developed only and get the negatives back from it. So I I scan everything myself. So I I like that aspect of it because you get to play around with the colors, um, yeah, the color side of things and like the contrast and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I have thought about um, developing it. I just like am afraid to jump into it. <laughs> I mean, that's that's fair. Um, it's. I mean, I, that was my first time the other day developing, um, doing tray development for sheet film. Because mm -hmm. I'm really used to the canisters. I don't think twice about doing 35 mil. I still need to practice more spooling um, 120 film on the, I use metal rolls. I don't have the little schnazzy plastic auto loader ones. I don't like those. I, I like my metal spiral ones. You fold it and you tuck it in and it's great. It's very tactile. <laughs> Um, but no, like at doing the tray development for the sheet film and I'm fumbling around in the dark and I'm like, I think this is right from everything I've looked up. I don't know. And then, you know, you flip on the lights after everything's done and like there's pictures there swimming in the soup and it's, that's a great feeling. And then if you, you know, when you're making your own prints and you've got, you know, your safe lights on and you can see the image appear on the paper. Oh, that's magic, man. That's such a great feeling. Yeah, I, I, I definitely get that. I want to get into it, um, but, you know, yeah, I'm sure you understand um, being in college, it's a <laughs> lot to, to handle, um, especially if it's just like a side hobby. Right. And, I, I mean, uh, to be f fair, I don't really shoot as much film as I probably should, um, just because, like, I it takes forever to scan film alone, so, you know, mm -hmm. I, I tend to not shoot it as much as I, I could be shooting it. Yeah. How much film do you usually shoot? Like, how, give me like an estimate in rolls or something. So it's a uh, it definitely kind of fell by the wayside during school since that's all digital. Um, I probably shot half a dozen rolls over the last couple of months uh, since I've been home. Um, there was a while where you know I'm doing online classes for the last month and a half of school, which ate up all of my time in wrapping up projects. Um, So it's definitely not, it's not been much lately. I'm, I'm easing back into it. Although, you know, with the, uh, you know, I've got my, my century graphic here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I went out for an hour or two and I shot four pictures <laughs> because it's, you know, I, I really like with the sheet film because it forces you to consider what you're taking a picture of. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, when you're used to shooting digital and then you start shooting 35 mil, even then it's like, oh, I only have so many shots. And then you start shooting 120 films, like, oh, I only have 10 shots if you're shooting 6x7, or if you're shooting 6x9, you know, you only have like, oh, I can only shoot like seven shots on this roll of film. I better make them count. Because then you have to load up another one. And this one, like, you, I have uh, four film backs. I can shoot eight shots unless I want to get a dark bag and load you know, film in the field, which I don't want to do. So I, I've, 
long long story short is I've always been a much more careful shooter than a lot of my um, my roommates. Um, just because of I'm used to shooting film. Um, yeah, we definitely take the digital age for granted and being able to just like delete as many photos as we want. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I was my uh, my photo essay professor. Um, you know, we would go out and shoot for the week, and he wanted to see our whole take for the week. And you know, we might have again, like I told you, uh, my buddy Carlin had twenty thousand images one week. Uh, I would usually come back between eight hundred and maybe I think at most I did like twenty four hundred images um, for the week because I, I tend to pick my shots carefully and if it's not worth shooting I don't shoot it um, but even then I can be a lot more careless with uh, the D850 and experimental in okay. a way that you can't with, uh, with film um, that is true what is your favorite type of film to shoot on okay so I'm, I'm, I'm an Ilford man okay. uh, I really like <laughs> I really like their Delta film stock. I've shot plenty of HP5. I found I really like Delta 400, um, and I really like if you take Delta 400 and you like uh, push it to 1600. Mm -hmm. It gets uh, you lose a little dynamic range, but you get some really nice, good contrast. Um, it's, it's fun. I like my my Ilford film stock. Yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting because I know like nine out of ten times you ask anyone that's in the film and they they always say like Porsche four hundred. Um, yeah, and I don't shoot a whole lot of color, um, just because it's a pain to process, and I would rather process it myself than send it off. Um, so I, I don't have much answer for film. Um, my my buddy James really likes um, Tri X. That's his that's his go to. Yeah. We had a, a freezer full of it um, at our house in Ohio. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of Ektar 100, and that's probably my favorite film to shoot on. I love how the, the blues come out and how, like, cold tone everything is usually, uh, or sometimes warm tone, just depending on how you, like, push or pull it. Um, but uh, let's see. Who, who or what are your biggest inspirations for photography? So that was something I definitely didn't have an answer to when I started school. Um, part of, you know, my education has been uh, looking more to what has already been done. Um, and people I admire, and there's some uh, folks who went to uh, the same program. I've got um, Matt Eich's poster on the wall there. Um, he gave a talk at the school a while ago. He's done some phenomenal work. Um uh, Alex Soth, I don't know if you've ever looked at anything he's done. Um, so he's, I have one of his, his books, um, if, <sighs> brilliant. He, it just, it's brilliant. He, uh, he shoots, uh, an eight by 10 camera and picks the most interesting subjects and gets to know them and translates that knowledge and understanding of a person and their mystery in his images and it's so good um and to, to the, i also like uh david burnett who also uses uh film he was at the uh, impeachment hearings um with a large format camera oh yeah yeah, like, yeah. If, yeah so he's he's great he's done olympics coverage like that um yeah i i like stuff like that yeah, so you're a huge film buff then. Um. <laughs> yeah, I it it, it spe the the people who tend to still like it for you know it, it forces you to consider your shot and you know you have to be very present in a way that you don't necessarily have to be with. I don't want to say present. You have to be present with your camera, right? With digital, you can pay more attention to the moment because you can let the camera assume a lot of the, the heavy lifting. Um, but you have to be creative when you're shooting film. Whether or not, you know, if you have enough light, if you're going to have the shutter speed depending on what you're shooting with. Um, there's, there's a lot more you can take for granted uh, when you're shooting digitally. 
Yeah, um, I absolutely feel that. I love shooting on film because, it, like you said, it, it forces you to like think about each individual shot that you take. So what kind of stuff do you like taking pictures of? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm really big right now. I'm big into astrophotography. That's probably like what I've been doing the most uh, since at least since quarantine has happened because it's the easiest thing I can do. Um, but I like landscapes and concert photography. Those are probably my top three things I take pictures of. Nice. And you said you're uh, you're in Austin. Yeah. So um, it's good. Go good to, music scene there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I work for a, a local station or, or I volunteer for a local station called Local Live um, and TSTV. Uh, they're the only student-run. Um, FCC certified broadcasting uh, TV station in the US uh, so cool. that's pretty cool um, and I, I shoot pictures for them uh, so I have a lot of like random small bands underneath my belt but I have shot for larger bands like uh, Sadie and the Ladies um, and uh, I don't know if you know who Colony House is uh, okay well they've toured with like Switchfoot Mute Math um they're touring with Fits in the Tantrum coming up. Oh, um, so, speaking of band photography, uh, do you know the band Illiterate Light? No, I don't. Okay, they're... Uh, do you know Shaky Graves? Yes. Okay, so they opened for Shaky Graves... Um, I think it was the last... Was it his last? No, it was the tour before last. He opened at the Georgia Theater in Athens, um, which was super cool. Anyways, the, he, uh, a year from that date, he did another... Um, you know, he was touring again. He was back at the Georgia Theater, and Illiterate Light opened for him, and they've been doing amazing things. But uh, oh, what's the name of the guy who does the photography for them? Um, I really, I've really been digging his um, his stuff. That's what I get for talking without knowing what I'm saying. No, I do that it? a lot. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Um, his work's really cool. Um, I think they were in Columbus, and uh, one of the under underclassmen um, got to take pictures of him and meet. Yeah, somewhere. I'll send it to you later, because his, his work's really cool. Yeah, one of my favorite... Um like concert photographers uh, is the concert photographer for the band Walk the Moon uh, she does amazing uh, pictures um, and does a really good job of just like capturing like really unique moments on the stage so I look to a lot of her work for inspiration I can't think of the, her name off the top of my head um, so I know you've talked about a lot um, as photojournalism being the thing that you're most into. So like, what would you define as the subject for photojournalism or like, what would you personally define the subject as? Um, I mean, it can, a noun, a person, place, or thing. So, uh, right. One of the, um, classes I, I most enjoyed out of the last year was photo essay. Um, do you know what a photo essay is? Sort of, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's it's an essay with pictures, right? Mm -hmm. So for a photo essay, we uh, our, our professor, Stan Alost, um, puts the names of about a dozen communities or so in his... He wears a 10-gallon hat. And he puts all the names of the communities in his hat, and you get to pick your community that you are assigned for the semester, and you have to do a photo essay on... Um, and try and encapsulate what it means to live in that community or be a part, you know, however you want to look at it, you know, because that's part of the class is to figure out what's your vision and how do you tell a story? How do you uh, capture that? So, you know, I've, I've done... You know, the way... Um, Ohio University builds its program is the first semester, uh, your primary production class is um, editorial photography, right? So stuff you might shoot for a newspaper. So it's broken down um, into assignments. So every week you have an assignment. Um, so the first one, or our first one was photojournalism. And it was pretty loose, shoot something 
photojournalistically think about a newspaper assignment, shoot a wide angle picture and a telephoto picture. Go forth, be creative, do something interesting. Our next one was emotion, right? So we had to capture three different emotions um, and try and, and have a, a diverse range of subjects, right? So while, you know, at one point, or on one hand, our subjects were people. On the other hand, our subjects were primarily their emotions, right? So it really depends on what you're shooting and why. Okay. Um, yeah. It's a really good answer to that question. Um, it's, it's complex. Um, <laughs> and I, I like that a lot. Um, so I guess going back to your uh, school and everything, like, so you did your undergrad at Georgia Tech. Um, mm -hmm. What, I, I wanted to go to Georgia Tech for the longest time. Um, and so now you're at Ohio State and you're doing oh, Georgia Tech. Not Ohio State, Ohio University. Sorry, Ohio sorry. State's in Columbia. Not, yeah. not OSU, <laughs> sorry. Um, so you're, you're Ohio University uh, and you're doing photojournalism. What do you want to do with your time there? Like, what do you expect to get out of it? So mostly what I'm getting out, uh, and I was talking with um, one of the guys who graduated this past spring, uh, last night a little bit. Kind of the reason we both ended up there is we wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything we didn't know that we didn't know, right? So I'm I'm pretty confident, and I always, you know, even when I started, pretty confident about my, my raw knowledge of photography. I understand the fundamentals. Um, I wanted to build out my understanding of the history and the profession, make connections, uh, and make sure there wasn't anything I was missing. Um, so I've, I've been getting a lot of that and building up my, you know, my confidence in my own ability, as well as, you know, if someone asks, oh, can you edit video? I'm like, well, yeah, I've put in a lot of time into it that I can, you know, I can confidently say, and I'm not lying about it because I've, I've put the time in. Uh, do you know how to do magazine layout? I've got magazine, a magazine class coming up in the fall. Um, like, yeah, I, I know how to do that. I know how to do InDesign. I can, you know, it's, it's a really good way of making sure that I am exposed to everything that I need to know. I can figure out what I like, what I don't, and how it plays in with photography, right? So it's, the program does a good job of not teaching just photography, but, so, I mean, you can take pictures, but here's what photo editors do with your pictures after you take them. You know how to do that. So now I have a better idea of what a photo editor would expect of me and how I can produce work that works with them, right? Because if, it's great, you can take good pictures, but if you don't know how to work with others or other people within the chain of production, you're no use to anyone. You're not going to get a call back. Yeah, that's, uh, you're definitely making a great use of your time. Um, one of the things that I love about um, the degree that I'm in, so I'm a radio, television, film major. Um, one of the, the greatest things about this major is that it, you don't have to take a focused path in anything. You tend to take classes that are, that are just structured out throughout media studies and you know you don't take like a single route in photography or a single route in film history or an actor or whatever you want you, you take all types of interweaved classes and so it just helps you uh, broaden your uh, knowledge on different things so yeah I definitely get what um, you're talking about how you're taking different classes to see like what you um, like and also to have that knowledge of um, being able to do that set thing so um, so you have some work you want to show? Um, yeah, um, I guess we'll, we'll start, I'll pull up my, uh, my website to start with. So the, I, one of my projects this summer is uh, I need to overhaul my website because right now it's basically a digital portfolio. It's what I applied to the program with. So it has some of the work I've done, um, just, you know, for fun around the house and some of the work I did um, at the elementary school. My screen sharing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so being married, I have uh, a subject on hand more often than not. Um, right now we live on a horse farm. So it's, it's sort of been an, an ongoing project that I have so much more I can add to this. Uh, pretty much everything you're gonna see on the website was shot with either the D80 or the D5600. Uh, I don't have anything with the D850 on here yet because I haven't touched this since, I don't know, last March when I applied for uh, 
the master's program. So this is, you know, when talking to people in the program working on my application, they're like, well, do you have any photo essays? Like I, at that point, I didn't know what that was. Right, so they were like, well, just a collection of images around the theme. Like, yeah, I can throw something together. So now with the knowledge I have and a wider body of work to pull from, I could get a, a much more focused essay here with a little more diversity in images. Because as you can probably tell, a bunch of these are from you know, the same sequence of events. So it's, it's fine. There's some okay images, horse jumping, great. Um, and some more interesting things that, you know, one of your jobs as a, a photojournalist is to try and bring people to places they otherwise wouldn't get to see. Um, I like that. <laughs> right. Well, so one of my favorite things that I got to do, and I, I man, I started off the semester running. Um, do you know Dan Erlewine? No, I or, don't. Okay. So, uh... Dan Erlewine is basically a legend amongst um, guitar technicians and luthiers, right? He builds and repairs guitars. He works with uh, Stuart McDonald, which is one of the largest uh, suppliers of guitar building and repair tools and materials. Happens to be in Athens, Ohio, where OU is, where um, Dan Erlewine lives. So when we had to do... Um, was it, uh, I think I did it for was it Slice of Life? Yeah, for Slice of Life. Um, I called up Dan Erlewine and was like, hey, Dan, I'm a master student at OU and can I take pictures at your shop? And he was like, yeah, which was, <laughs> it blew my mind. It's someone who I've seen on the internet, right, on YouTube, building guitars and doing things and, you know, massive audience. My dad has a book that Dan Erlewine put out on Guitar Repair, signed in 1992, right? And he was like, yeah, come hang out. And I hung out in his shop, uh, you know, all day and took pictures of, you know, the man, the myth, the legend, uh, met um, some of the people who worked in his shop, uh, and later in the semester went to, uh, went to Nashville with him. Um, for Thanksgiving while his band recorded some new songs for their next album. Um, sorry, I'm getting off track. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I think a big part of uh, the work that I did that got me into the program was the stuff at South Jackson because I of my position as a paraprofessional, right? I was in a bunch of different classrooms. I chaperoned on a bunch of field trips. I took pictures of school events and the trips and, you know, what have you. And that's a, a position that not a lot of people have. You know, parents hear about school from their kids, but they don't get to be there when, you know, their kids, uh, you know, uh, where's the image I was looking for? Where the kid's rehearsing for the school play. They might not even make it to the school play, but you know, if I'm there taking pictures, they can see it after the fact. Um, so it's it's capturing little moments and being able to share them. You know, like going on the multiple overnight field trips for the fourth and fifth graders. You know, there are a couple parents chaperone, but they don't get to to be there for all the moments and the silliness and trying to get at all of that. I think is important and I've got my collection of singles which is just pictures I like you know a lot of animals I have way too many animal pictures um, no I feel that I have, I have a dedicated page on my website just for like animals that I've taken at zoos and stuff like that yeah um, and you know some lucky shots uh, when I went to DC um, there's a I think it, it's a Oh, I forget which airport it is. Anyways, there's a sort of an unofficial park at the end of one of the runways, um, and they took us there. And I was taking pictures of the planes flying, and I managed to catch a bat in the same frame. Yeah, I can't that's... tell you how long I tried to get that shot. That's really cool. That's an uh, amazing, like once in a lifetime shot too. Yeah, it's just you know, being there with your camera. And then, you know, I've produced uh, just a 
metric ton of work for um, school. Um, yeah, so I've got... Go to the VizCom. So I shot 17,000 pictures last semester. I only did 5,000 this semester, um, this spring semester. Uh, I don't know how you uh, organize your um, digital photography, but it's desperately important to have a good organization system so you can find your images after the fact. Um, yeah, I need to jump on how you're organizing it. I just kind of throw everything into like a, a, a hard drive that I have just based on like date or sometimes by like description of what it is. Yeah, so I need to clean this up. I, I like how I'm doing um, this year's better where it's just month, date, and keyword. Um, so for a photo essay, right, uh, the, uh, the community, I, I keep wanting to say town, but it's not really a town if there's less than like two dozen people living there. Um, yeah, Mineral, Ohio, I have a bit of a, I love Mineral, Ohio. Yeah, I've been seeing your pictures on Instagram about it. Yeah, so for a photo essay, we kind of pivoted at the end um normally you do your photo essay and then you do a narrative typically within the community you've been working in because you know the people and the story um at that point we didn't get to the narrative portion of things and we didn't really get to finish our essays either before the university kind of sent us all home um but we we produced you know we each edited all of our work down and did a, a nice little write-up of our communities with the, the images we gathered um, and, you know, tried to capture the essence of our communities. And we ended up putting it all together in one big um, laid-out PDF. I still need to order my, my copy of the, uh, the magazine. Um, but that was a, a wild experience. Um, and I think this is one of the biggest confidence boosters I've had in that class was just showing up as a stranger in a small insular community out in the foothills of Appalachia and you know walking up to people and going hi my name's Eric you know I'm a student at OU here's what I'm doing can I can I make your picture you know can I can I hang out and watch what you're doing and you know snap some pictures and more often than not everyone was like yeah Please, to, like I, they, everyone wants to talk about themselves a little bit, right? Yeah, absolutely. Everyone wants to to share a little bit of their story and to have someone who's interested in capturing it and sharing it or telling it or wants to understand is, you know, as long as you're being honest about it and open, they're pretty uh pretty receptive. Oh, I, I love that picture, the one that you scrolled above just a few seconds ago, the one with the hand and the cigarette. I uh, saw that yeah. one on your Instagram. Every Everyone loves a, a picture of a working man's hand with a cigarette. Um, my The professor, Stan, um, saw that picture and started jumping up and down. Um, the, the way the whole program is sort of set up is it doesn't matter how good your work is. It can be better. And the professors know it, and they need to make sure that you know it. Doesn't matter, this is a great image. And he knew that, and he knew that I knew it. But he knew it could have been better. And they do so much to instill all these little voices in your head that tell you, get closer, try this angle, make sure your background's clean. What um, photographic constructs are you using to help emphasize your message? Um, and I, it hurts a little bit. Um, part of the part of the program is you are a, a candidate, right, before you are a student. So halfway through the semester, they make you gather all of the images you have produced uh, for grad review, and you have to print out, right, on 8x10s all of the pictures you have produced and lay them out on a table, and they you select what, you know, three professors, so your, your advisor, and then you pick two professors, to tear your, your pictures apart 
and question you on why are you in the program and what do you want to get out of it and what right do you have to you know they're they're not mean about it but they're very hard and they grill you and almost no one passes the first review everyone pass almost everyone passes the second one unless you have no business being in the program but you do not for a second feel confident that they are going to accept you as a student because they know your work can be better and you know it too um yeah Sounds rigorous. <laughs> it, it, it kicks your ass, but the, the program has produced some incredible students. Um, and I've gotten to meet so many fascinating people um, through the program who have either been in it or, you know, it's pushed me to seek out um, interesting subjects. And it's it's been really, it's been something. There it is. Oh, there it is. Okay, so yeah, I mean, it's it's great to see your work. I've I've never really met anyone that's like really into uh, photojournalism, so it's definitely new seeing like what seems to be like just snapshots of everyday life. But it's really cool that like it is a snapshot of, of everyday life, and you're viewing it uh, as if you were like right there in the moment. So it's really cool to see like that. It's, it's definitely a different way of, of looking at things. And, you know, a, lo a lot of it is structured around trying to, uh, where is it? You know, tell a story. I'm trying to find um, my pictures from Nashville because I th felt like that turned out to be a pretty good um, essay. And, uh, you know, if you've never tried it, go shoot sports. Yeah. Right. Get a get a press pass. Go to a football game. I did marching band. Saw a lot of football games. Right. I have never enjoyed a football game more than when I was like sitting on the sidelines behind like a three or four hundred millimeter lens, trying to follow the action and compose compelling front. It's so much fun. I wanted to, but you know, if you know anything about UT culture, UT football games are extremely hard to get into unless you know. You know, so are OU games, but I found if you have a polo uh, and you wear khaki pants and you've got a big enough camera with a big enough lens, and you go, "Hey, is the game started yet?" You can walk right in uh, to the sidelines, um, and no one seems to bat an <laughs> eye. I don't recommend it. I don't think I would do it again, but. Uh, I've heard I've heard people have gotten good results from that. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> uh, yeah, part of part of the working at the station that I work at is they do give out free press passes if you are working with one of the sports uh, TV shows on the channel. Nice. Um, but I don't I don't have that much of an interest to like follow. Um, to to follow up getting like a press uh, pass to go shoot games although I've always wanted to um, I've just never like actually taken the initiative to go do it yeah uh, so what are some tips and tricks that you use when shooting um I, or unless you're still looking for those photos I, I totally interrupted that. no you're good I was just kind of scrolling through things um tips and tricks uh you know, get close, fill the frame. Um, I think one of the things that uh, the program has also taught me is um, don't include extra stuff in your picture, right? You should, it's not always possible, but ideally there shouldn't be anything within your frame that you didn't intentionally put there, if at all possible, right? You know, the uh, part of the reason the, the, you know, that hand with the smoking cigarette works so well is because that's all there is in the picture, right? It would be even better if I had been able to, I was shooting with, um, I've got an old uh, 85 1.8 D lens, so that was as close as I could get with it, unfortunately. Some of that's knowing your, your, uh, your gear which I guess would be another tip. Know your gear inside and out, forward and backwards, be able to operate it in the dark. Um, but it works because it's it's the hand, it's the cigarette, it's beautifully in focus. You get the little glint of the ring. You see all of the 
motor oil and dirt and grime on his hands. You can see he's got an old work shirt. And you can tell him it looks like he is a mechanic or used to be a mechanic. Right? It's everything you need to know is in that picture. And nothing else. Um, you know, in sports, that's kind of what you want to see, right? You want to you wanna have the ball in the frame. And you want a, an expression, right? You want some emotion or connection. Um, and that's, I guess, been one of the biggest things is trying to... A, a pretty picture is great. But I am finding more and more that I don't want to take a picture unless there is some purpose or meaning encapsulated within it. Right? I, I want to have some intention with it. I haven't gone out to really cover any of the protests, um, although there's plenty around, because I don't feel like I have a, a specific narrative or reason for capturing them, and I don't want to go out just to, like, pad my portfolio. That's yeah, shitty, absolutely. more or less, right? Um, there's plenty of other people with skin in the game, um, and I'm happy to, to let them do their do their thing right now and if at some point I, I have a good reason or then I'm happy to go out and add my my voice but yeah I don't know I think I lost the the thread there a little bit as far as tips and tricks go um, don't carry around too much gear you'll hurt your back that, that is a very valid point yeah so I, I have I have two camera bags right I have the the venerable Donkey F2. Love this bag to death. It's. I also have um, like a Pelican, um, you know, regular. I've got the one that is. If it was any bigger, it wouldn't fit in a luggage compartment in a plane. This functions like that. I can put a camera, three lenses, my flash, my chargers, uh, a couple of granola bars, a flashlight, uh, battery charger, and my my little air blower. Uh, but it weighs like 20 pounds if I load it up. Yeah. So that it's the kind of thing where it's great. I put everything in it, and if I can stash it in a corner somewhere and come back to it where I can trust that it won't be stolen, it's perfect. Otherwise, it is almost too big because you can put too much stuff in it. Uh, I find what I prefer is I've got a little Think Tank V5, one of the little oh. retrospective ones. It's cute. It's perfect, right? So with my belt, I've got... You know, my, my D850 on my hip. I usually have the D5600 around my shoulder. And then I can have another two lenses in here. And then, you know, I can juggle things around as needed. Plus a granola bar and a lens cloth. Um, always carry a granola bar, at least, <laughs> when you're going out shooting. Because you never know when you're going to need to stay longer or grab a snack. Like... That's, that's another good tip. Have granola bars in your camera bag all the time. Have food, yeah. That's, I've never thought about that, but yeah, that makes sense. Um, what keeps you motivated? What keeps you up and shooting? I like telling stories and I like meeting people. Um, it gets me out of the house. Uh, it makes me wake up to catch sunrise. Um, Oh man, I, we would get texts or emails from Stan, um, you know, 6.50, 6.45 in the morning. It's a beautiful sunrise. How'd it look out in your communities? And more often than not, it, like we're paranoid about checking the weather. It's like, oh, is it gonna be, is it gonna be cloudy tomorrow? Because if it's cloudy, you can sleep in. Because if it's cloudy, it looks the same from sunrise to about sunset, right? Yeah. But if like, oh, there might be some sun, you gotta get up early, you gotta be out there. Um, Cause, you know, sunrise only happens once a day. <sighs> and everyone loves a, a sunrise or sunset picture. Yeah, uh, I think it's a little cliche, but you know. It, it... it is, but like, I mean, some of the best pictures I got out in Mineral were a uh, Super Bowl day. Um, some 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 of the locals standing out on the state route that runs through the town, right? There's two stop signs in town, but they don't stop the the you know the main flow of traffic. But no one's through there, so they're out hanging out, throwing a football around at sunset. It's so much fun, just ah, uh, it's good. People are out 
you gotta be out shooting them. If the light's good, your images are gonna look good. You can take the weirdest pictures, but if the light's good, your your image is gonna be something else. Sure. That, that next level. Understandable. Um, have you had any like major clients? Um I would say not really not yet. Um I I mean I've done some work for um you know, I shot some things for the school more or less. Um oh, what's um that's uh, so Molly Roberts, the uh, senior photo editor for Nat Geo, who's now the Night Fellow for our school, um, hosted for um, I think it's Women Photographers of Washington. Um, she hosted a, an event and had uh, Lynn Johnson, who she is just the coolest. She's done some phenomenal photojournalistic work. Um, anyway, she came to to talk in a in a panel discussion. Uh, and I got to take pictures of Lynn Johnson uh, during that, and uh, and he hung around after and got to go get drinks with them all, which is really fun. Um, and everyone, like, there was an open invitation, but no one else, I guess, heard that there was an open invitation to go out for drinks with Lynn frickin' Johnson. Um, so it was just me and Molly and uh, one of the other night fellows, Brooke, uh, who's a freelance photographer based out of Columbus, and she's awesome. Anyways, um, everyone was like, wait, they went out for drinks afterwards and you got to go too? Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> I, got to, I got to rub that in everyone's face a little bit. Um, but yeah, no major clients yet. I'll, I'm hoping. Yeah. Um, you always got to have high hope for the future. Uh, speaking of the future, what are your plans for the future, um, whether they involve photography or not? I mean, ideally, they'll involve photography. I want to keep pursuing, you know, my, my own film projects, just taking pictures with film. I would like to um, kit out one of my, probably the, the mini speed graphic once I get it rebuilt, as a more proper, um, like, press camera, right? Uh, I would love to rig it up with a more modern flash um, I have some old flash bulbs. I'm, I really don't want to use them. I would rather use an electronic flash. Um, but I, I think that would be fun to, to go cover events with an old sheet film camera. Um, yeah. I have some, some other plans for ridiculously large format cameras. Uh, not that that's anything new for most people. And I want to play around with um, some gum bichromate printing and alternative uh, film processes. But... Aside from that, I don't know. Wherever I can find a job after I get out of school, uh, I like doing video work, whether it's editing or filming. So okay. whatever I can get. Yeah. Um, are you into like 3D printing at all? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I've also done some 3D modeling. Okay. Um, I don't know. So when I was screen sharing, um, if you look at the uh, the background, that's something that I, I 3D modeled. Um, actually, I did that like three years ago. Um, for the, you know, the Twitch channel that my, my wife and I use. Um, more recently for a class assignment, uh, we had digital imaging. I did this um, little render. Okay, um, yeah. Which is just like a little mock-up of my, my office space here. Um, we we're trying to cover an editorial issue, so I was like, inside good, outside bad, because that was like you know, late March, early April. Um, so I haven't, I've done a little bit of 3D printing. Uh, one of the first digital sculptures I did was of um, a face cube. So it was a cube, I was like, I sculpted a face on it, and it's really gross. Um, and at the elementary school, we had a 3D printer. So that was always my test print, is I would print out this little, I've got a, I've got one that glows in the dark. Actually, let me go grab it real quick. This little bad boy. <laughs> That's so. cool. Yeah. So um, I've, I've dabbled. I would love to get a 3D printer at some point. Um, 
But I, I, you've done some, right? Yeah, I have a 3D printer myself, and I do 3D renderings. Not, I don't, um, I don't 3D model anything like on the extent that you do. Most of my 3D printing is just like I want something, and if it's tangible to 3D print it, then I make it myself, or I try to find files for it and I print it. Um, I'm trying to think if I've done anything cool camera-wise. I 3D printed a camera mount for my drone that I had a while ago. I think that's really the only cool thing I've done with it. Nice. Um, what kind of uh, what kind of drone do you have? Oh, it was just some cheap like Walmart oh. drone. I ended up taking it apart for parts anyways. Um, nice. Um, but yeah, I, I asked that question because I know they have like 3D printed cameras now, like source your own files and stuff. So I was just wanting to know if you ever thought about like getting into that. I thought about it. Um, so my dad and I build instruments is another thing. Um, so, you know, we've built some, some stick dulcimers. My dad's built uh, a couple bass guitars. Um, so he's, he's a guitar tech. So I have a, a really nice set of small tools, which has been great for working on the cameras. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we do some woodworking. Um, so if I want to build something, usually that's my, my first thought is like, I'd build it out of wood. Um, I've been toying around with the idea. One of the things I want to do over the next couple weeks while I have that speed graphic disassembled is do a really nice model like each individual part in it and do like a really nice exploded view printout poster kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah. but if i had 3d models of all the parts and all the measurements then i could potentially fabricate my own probably not quite to the the specs but you know i could i would love to build my own small little um field camera okay yeah um that's that's really cool um Dang it, I had a question for you, but I forgot it. Um, have you done today's video? <laughs> uh, so I, I filmed it, actually. Um, where did I put the... So I think I mentioned it in um, one of the videos uh, previously. I know I filmed it. I don't know if it ended up getting edited out. So uh, the Century graphic I have here and the Speed graphic that's now in pieces uh, and all in individual baggies on the table. Um, they have the same lens. It's a little Trioptar Graflex triplet f4.5 mm -hmm. 103 millimeter lens. Um, this one is a little sticky down at like a tenth of a second. Yeah, you I think were I worked out that. Yeah. So I, I had both of the lenses apart, um, and the other one wouldn't close. Right. Mm -hmm. So it was stuck wide open. You would hit it, and the uh, you know, the shutter would close and then open again. So I disassembled it. Um, and because I had two lenses, right? You have, you said you're working on building a computer, right? Mm-hmm. Have you ever built one before? No, this is my first PC build, so. Cool. So troubleshooting PC parts is almost impossible unless you've already built a PC and you have extra parts. Yeah, yeah, that's what I've heard, so. Right, so, because then you can, like, well, is it the CPU and you swap one out? Or is it the graphics card and you try, or did you try the cables? So, because I had two lenses that were not broken, but not working in different ways, I was able to take them apart side by side mm, mm -hmm. and compare and then rebuild it. And I had to make some modifications, but they're both working now, which. Okay, uh, that's really I'm cool. Very proud of. Uh, and yeah, so that's today's video. I have everything shot. I have um, the full take loaded and synced in uh, Adobe Premiere. So I just have to cut between my camera angles uh, and cut out all the extra useless bits. Okay. Yeah, then, I'm always looking forward to that. That's. Uh, I know you don't have like a regular upload schedule, but I have your post <laughs> notifications on. So. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, the the only one that caught me off guard was that one night that you posted at like 1.30 a.m. <laughs> oh, that one, I was so upset that that one kind of missed schedule. But I really wanted to have the, you know, the copies of the pictures in the... I didn't want to have to split it apart because I had everything else edited. Had it all edited. And then our the D Dungeons & Dragons session ran late. Um, so I, I was late you know, developing the film mm -hmm. and then it has to dry and then I had to take pictures of it and get the, it. <sighs> I got it done. <laughs> it was late, but it was done. Uh, I haven't missed the day yet. Yeah. Aside I, from that's being a that's amazing. I, I appreciate the grind and everything you've put out like more videos and this month than like, 
I have in probably a year or and a half of doing this channel. So that's pretty amazing, and I'm looking forward to seeing like how you end up growing. And and, uh, and I'm yeah, always well, going to be. Wait, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say I've been enjoying um, digging digging through some of your channels, and you know you do. Your videos are produced sort of over, you know, a longer time span, right? You cover a lot of your trips and things, and then you do your yeah. heavily produced um, but on trombone, which I, I get a huge kick out of. Um, yeah. <laughs> those take me, like, months to do. So yeah, it's anytime I'm working on one of those videos, all the videos around it are just kind of like side projects that I do really quickly and throw out there just so I have content to post. But, yeah, this, this last but on trombone video took, like, probably a month to do the, the recordings and track it out and mix and master it with my brother and then like two weeks to do um, the writing and the uh, recordings and everything in the green screen stuff but yeah it takes the, those videos take a lot of effort and you know in, in uh, remarks they, they do get like exponentially more views than anything else on my channel so right. definitely gonna stick to it yeah it's all about I mean that's that's the trick is being consistent. Um, you see that in Twitch a lot. I've got um, a couple of friends who stream more or less full time. Right, that's their whole gig is YouTube and Twitch. Um, and it was really just doing it consistently for long enough and building up that audience. So gotta gotta stick to that grind. Yeah, for sure. I'm not a very good videographer either, so I struggle a lot with that that end of aspect of things. So I try my best to, to make it look as good as I can get it. Yeah, well, it's all it's all putting in putting in the time, right? And that's yeah. that's kind of what um, I don't think we've talked about it on this episode necessarily, but you know, the uh, doing a video a day for the month of June has been just putting in the time. It's uh, a deadline is the best way to make sure something happens, which is part of why I'm really glad I went back to school because there's no other way I would have taken 17,000 images over the last eight months. Um, and I, you know, I've got some really good, incredible pictures, and it's forced me, you know, it forces you to go out of your comfort zone to achieve something and figure out what works, what doesn't, and uh, how to work under pressure. You know, there's a lot of figuring out, well, how, what can I get away with? And also knowing I'm not going to have time to do this. What can I do instead to, to try and get the best alternative out? Yeah. Um, I'm definitely, um, I definitely admire your aspiration and your drive right now for YouTube. It's so much to where like my upload schedule was every other week on Fridays at 9 a.m. to the point now that I'm trying to put out a video at least once a week. It's nowhere near what you're doing, but... Um, <laughs> well, I also have the advantage of right now, um, every internship I applied for uh, this summer fell through. Go figure. Don't know what that's about. Uh, I don't have a job right now, but I am not... You know, I don't really need one. Uh, my wife works. Part of her gig working on the horse farm is it provides a place for us to stay. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, so I'm, I'm good to sit here and work on my own projects and overhaul my website and work on my portfolio and other useful things. But it also gives me plenty of time to go take pictures and upload a video a day, which, yeah. you know. I don't have to tell you, it's it's a fair bit of work editing, even for the short videos, especially like all of the project videos I do where it's like I've got the top-down angle or camera and the other one pointed. Cutting between those two and, you know, if I record for two hours, that's that's a lot of footage to go through. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, I'm going to be honest, the podcasts are like so easy to make because you just sit there and record and then you import the audio and... <laughs> You just cut out the junk if you need to, so mm -hmm. it's nice. Um, that's why I'm doing a focus on it. I'm, I'm hoping um, you're the last photographer that I have for sure lined up for now. But um, well, no, I have one more. Her name's Avery Norman. Um, she's a fellow photographer friend of mine in Austin. Um, but if if you know anyone else, uh, send them my way. I'd love to sit down and sure. chat with them. Um, I'm always looking for. Um, 
anyone of like any influence uh, I don't care how big or small they are I, I'd love to sit down and talk photography with people but yeah. um, with that being said do you have any final thoughts any last questions uh, I think you've let me ramble more than enough <laughs> No, um, this is good. I, I'm, I love this episode. It's great to hear um, from you. This is the first episode I've done with someone that I, I'm like not really, I don't really know um, a lot with, about or who. So it was cool to like meet with like a stranger, I guess. And, and, yeah. Uh, uh, do you have any more questions for me or? No, that I think that answered everything on my list. And we had a ton of other questions and we've been running for about an hour and 15 minutes now. So. I have plenty of um, time on my hand, so. Um, but uh, I guess just to wrap this up, um, I'm gonna put all of Eric's links down in the description. Just make sure you send them to me at some point. Um, and uh, just give him a follow on Instagram. Go check out his website. And uh, please subscribe to him um, so half my accounts aren't his subscribers anymore. Um, I know you listened to the last podcast, and I had mentioned that before, but, like, I have four accounts, and so I follow you on, like, all four accounts. Yeah, I mean, that's all right. Like, well, one of the other subscriptions is from my other account. Uh, I think my wife is subscribed, and then um, I need to, to get uh, after more of my uh, friends from Twitch, from our, our streaming stuff. Yeah, how many, like, I don't really know how Twitch works, but, like, how many, like, followers do you have on Twitch? Uh, I mean, so we have a lot more followers than uh, necessarily active participants, I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. I can actually pull up our follower count. Um, we have uh, about 1,600 followers on there. Oh, okay, so that's a pretty decent following. <laughs> yeah, when we were doing it regularly... Um, we would usually average around 20 to 30 people watching a stream, which is pretty good for a, a smaller channel. Um, yeah, absolutely. One of our one of our buddies who uh, streams full time um, does a game jam weekends, right? Uh, I don't. Do you ever program any games or anything? Program any games? Yeah. Ah, uh, no, my extent of programming was like doing robotics in high school, and that was it, so never okay. really did programming, uh, like computer programming. So there's a, a game jam, uh, you know, it's a community-based sort of game competition where you have 48 hours to make a game, but you have to produce everything by yourself. So I've, there's also a, a group competition the same weekend where you get an extra day, and you can use existing libraries. I've done that with some of my friends. I usually do art and music for it um anyways when after he makes his games uh over the course of the weekend we usually do the play test afterwards so he hosts us or watches it and he's usually averages like two thousand people watching his streams and then we wow. get to play for all of them it's like you know being the opening band for a much larger act and yeah. you get to kind of mooch off some of their audience that's a lot of fun yeah that's really cool <laughs> um but yeah any any final thoughts uh, take pictures, be creative, wash your hands, <laughs> stay That's inside. That's <laughs> <laughs> all I got right now. Well, Eric, uh, thank you so much for uh, sitting down and chatting with me for uh, a little over an hour. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, and if you made it to this far into the, uh, into the podcast, just make sure you leave a like comment and subscribe if you're not already please subscribe to eric um boost his subscribe count up he's a really um up and coming youtuber so i'm excited to see where you end up going and everything so uh once again thanks for watching and i will see you in the next episode of the podcast see you folks